God's grace will continue. Lord, I thank you for today and I thank you that we now can come to your presence through your word, Lord, and I pray that your word will be heard and your word will be encouraging to us. Help us to cope with life. Amen. And Lord, help us mature in you. And God, help us to know how to orientate ourselves, Live a life that is fruitful, as Paul says, and not allow life to pass by. So I pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Allow me to be clear, Lord. Amen. 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 So here we go. Um, so as I said, we'll be looking from verse 20. And if you have your Bibles, please um, have a look through as I go by. And we'll try to make sense together. To me, this has been a uh, very fruitful study and I have found it very helpful myself and I've struggled to title this because I was ending up with two long lines. But what we want to see today is more on the ingredient that Paul finds of how he found himself emotionally, spiritually, and mentally healthy how was he able to keep himself emotionally spiritually and mentally healthy and he gives us right in verse 20 towards the last part of verse 20 he says that's the ingredient there brothers and sisters he says in order for me to keep healthy in these three elements uh, I just read that and it says but that with full courage, I now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body. That is the ingredient that Paul tells us helps him to keep um, emotionally, spiritually, and mentally healthy. Now, let's dig a little bit more and explain exactly what that means to us and to him as well. If you look in scriptures, brothers and sisters, Bible speaks in many places about heart. And one of the um, famous sayings is the desires of our hearts. It speaks a lot about that, doesn't it? And often when we, when we hear that word heart, it's not speaking about our physical muscle that we have here, that's pumping blood all over our body and keeping us alive. In a sense, it is a very essential part in our heart because if there is trouble there, we are in trouble. Um, but actually, the Bible brings us to this space. So you need to think of this room in your body where a lot of things that makes us of who we are are stored. And that place leads the whole body. So this is what Paul is saying. That he has made a decision that Christ will be honored. And that word honor has the meaning, the depth of that word is to, make, to magnify, to make him big in my life. And, um, and uh, the NIV translation, it says to be exalted. I have a little image there um, to let us just get a bit more glimpse and don't laugh. Uh, it's not great, um, but it will make sense, I hope. So that's our heart. That's the room that Paul wants us to look at. So if we, if we were to imagine our heart as a space within us, we will see, brothers and sisters, that in one corner, over there, we have desires. The desires of our heart, as I said, uh, Scripture speaks about. And there we also have our longings which are stored. We have our hopes are stored there. And we too have our dreams that are stored in that area. But also remember, it's there where our desires sometimes turn bad. Where they become temptations. And this is where the expectations are also developed. So with other words, that, that corner of our heart is really busy busy 
uh, a lot of activity is going on there. But then on the other side, and the other corner if you like, we have emotions that are stored. And within our emotions, we have the three negative emotions uh, within us, which is anger, it is sadness, and is anxiety. But also, within that corner, we have the feeling or the emotions of joy. We have peace, and we also have love. And these are the things that God wants us to have. Those are stored in another corner of our heart, brothers and sisters. But then down the bottom, in the other corner of our room, if you like, we have the beliefs. Sometimes we tend to have some strange beliefs. And these will affect our behavior. It will make us do peculiar things. And trust me, I have seen one or two myself. Within this room, you can see there is a lot of competition going on. But the most important is right in the center of it. What can we see there? It's that master space. And brothers and sisters, I, would, I could not find an image um, good enough to put there. It's supposed to be a chair. There is a chair right in the middle, which you cannot see, but it's there. It's the masterpiece, it's the master space where all the mothership is controlled. As I said in scripture, we see that heart is that central unit that guards the whole body. And that place there, it's in great demand. Now, what do you think when we preach, when we share, when scripture says, accept Christ into your heart, where do you think he goes? Right in the middle. And this is, this is what Paul is saying. I want Christ to sit in that chair. I want Christ to sit right in the middle over there. So he could rule my whole body. I want Christ to be big. I want Christ to be magnified. I do not want him to be in one of the corners where other little stuffs are stored. I want him to be at the chair where he drives the whole thing forward. We well, see, you have a lot of competition going on there, brothers and sisters. Sometimes you have the desires that get quite strong and tend to push Christ into their place, tend to put Christ in the corner and the desires take to take control. And if we allow them to take control, then that's where temptations come our way. And when temptations have taken upon us, we end up doing the wrong thing. But we don't, don't forget, the other side could be as well, emotions can take control, push Christ to the side, and things like anger will drive us. And when we are doing things in anger, when we are doing things um, based on emotions, that too will be the wrong decision. That too will be the wrong path that um, we will be using or we will be doing. So Paul, in a sense, here is saying that I want to share with you a secret. I want to share with, uh, with you a secret because this is what is in my life and this is what you need in your life. Because as Christians, this is what we need to recognize. Christ is not a small thing. Christ cannot be in one of the corners of our heart. He must be in the center. He must be magnified and in control of all of the things that are going on into our hearts. Hallelujah. He is the master controller, brothers and sisters. And also when we allow that to be in our life, he also becomes the professional organizer and he's really good at that. He organizes our life he gets all of the desires and all of the emotions all in place where they need to be. 
because we are honoring Christ and everything else supposed to be in place. And brothers and sisters, according to what we read here, that is one of the greatest tools of our emotional, spiritual, and mental health, is to honor Christ into our hearts, to magnify, to make Him big into our hearts. In the hearts is where we make the decisions. And in our minds sometimes, there's a lot of crazy things going on. But when we honor Christ, we are organized with all of those things that are happening because we have a fixed goal and our fixed goal is that we are going towards honoring Christ. Now as we read for, further to that passage, Paul tells us that he does this in two ways, magnify Christ. And how does he do that? He says either by life or by death. In other words, he's saying, I'm either going to live or I'm going to die. There is a real possibility of these things. Where is Paul currently at this situation? He's in prison. And he is about to go in front of the courts. And they are to, to determine if he is guilty, he'll die. Or he, if he is innocent, he will live. So the two possibilities are a real thing for him. He's not just saying um, because it's a good thing to say if you like. But as you read further down um, in verse 22, there is a wrestling going on into the hearts of Paul. He cannot make a decision. This is what it says. Yet, which, I sh which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. In other words, I really do not know which one I'm going to choose. But the great thing is that they are both good opportunity for me. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter which one I choose, they are both good opportunities for me. And as we see this, brothers and sisters, I think this is also one important key to our emotional health. As we look into our future, one thing that we recognize is that we face many opportunities. If this happens, that is good for me. But what Paul wants us to, to know and bring us to an understanding is that we come to that neutralized place where we are able to say, these are the opportunities in our life. If this happens, I'm okay. Or maybe that happens to me. I'm all right with that too. But there is no disappointment in the life of Paul, is there? He has, there is two things that he is dealing with. But yet, which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. And the two are, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ. For that is far better for me. But to remain in flesh is more necessary for your account. So it's two things that Paul is dealing, and I think it's two things that we very much deal in regular basis in our life. The one is the desire, and the two, the necessary, the need that we have in our life. More than not, you will come to a situation where you feel, I really would like to just sit and watch a movie. That is a desire. But then something in the back of your mind kicks in. But I must cut the lawn. The grass needs to be cut. Any of you had that problem recently? The two weeks of rain, my grass just shot up. And it took me two hours to cut on the week that was dry. So you have the need in one side. And then you have the desire in the other. 
which one shall I choose? Paul says, I have a desire. I long to go to my God. I long to be with Christ. And that is far better for me. But I have a need. And that need is, do I remain living? Do I decide to stay? But if I stay, that's necessary. That is good for you that I stay here. But you see, for Paul, there is no discouragement. There is no disappointment in him. I choose my desire, great. I don't choose my desire, do the need. That's good too. I win either way. And this is, this is the key that Paul wants us to understand, brothers and sisters. And I think it's an important lesson for us to understand as well. The youngsters, and I can see the two of mine over there. If we allow them, they can watch iPad, play with their games all day long. But sometimes their mommy and daddy will say, you need to get the garbage out, the rubbish out. Or you need to fix your room. So they have the desire and then the need comes forth. <coughs> what do I do? How do I do one or the other that do not conflict? And I think it's important for us to come to that neutral place where Paul we find in Scripture here. And I don't think it's wanting to do the right thing that we can say that is maturity, brothers and sisters. I think it's doing the right thing even if I don't want to. That is a sign of maturity in us. Learning to put the need over the desire. I think that's the necessity. That is the discipline that we find in ourselves. That is what helps us with our diet. That is what helps us with our budget. That is what helps us generally in life. And learning to do that in that neutral place while allowing Christ to be the center of our body where everything else it's not that we are excluding our feelings they are very much part of but knowing that Christ is the center and he is driving our life everything else will take second seats and he is in charge and we are learning to work in a way that is suitable for us all. So let's see on the first, brothers and sisters, on the desire that Paul has. He says, it is my desire to depart and be with Christ. That is far better for me. That is my desire. Why? Because he's thinking of heaven. And don't misunderstand, this is not because he's sick of life. It's not that he has had enough of it, he just wants to escape. He is in a place where he's been in a shipwreck, where he is beaten, he's been in prison, and his body is just about saying, I've had enough, it's time to go home. And he is heavenly minded, brothers and sisters. Look, his greatest desire is to be with God. His greatest desire is to be with Christ. And he says, that is far better than I am with God in heaven. My body is about to give way. And that is my greatest desire that I would like to be there. And I think, brothers and sisters, as we look at the passage, I think for us, if we take some time and ponder in our life and reflect about heaven, think of what heaven means to us, I believe that our life in the earth will be a lot easier. We get a new perspective of our Christian life here. We have been doing studying um, on the Tuesdays and I think it has helped us quite a lot to understand many areas which we would never ask usually. There was a little girl, a nine-year-old girl, um, I thought I'd put this in, which she was asked about heaven. She says, 
what do you think heaven is like? And her response was, oh, heaven. In heaven, there is no homework. And then she gasped, unless my teachers will be there. And then she's like, no, no, even if my teachers will be there, I don't think there will be homework there. As funny as this sounds, you see a perspective of heaven. You see her little mind appreciating heaven of what heaven will be like. For all of those who believe in Jesus Christ is a promise. What do you think heaven is like for you? What is your opinion about heaven? You see, it's very important we talk about these things, brothers and sisters. You see, for me, I come from a Muslim background, you see. When I accepted Jesus in my heart, I was reading just about every passage I could find and learn more. And then I was looking about heaven. I was mesmerized about the golden streets, the beautiful crystal rivers. Part of me was feeling, oh, I'm going to have a lovely time swimming on them. But I bet you there will be regulations. Thy shall not swim in the rivers or something like that. With all of those things that was taking my attention, how beautiful it will be there. But now, I think it's changed. One of the greatest things that I long for, Scripture says that He will create a new heaven and He will create a new earth. God will be the center of it all. But the thing that I will enjoy the most is being with people. Being with people that I will love to spend time with. That is the essential thing that I look forward to. I don't care where it will be. It will be being with people that are of one mind. Spending time with them that I love spending time with and worshiping God together. You know, Jesus himself said that I am going so that you may be there with me also. Because if I don't go, you will not be able to come. So Jesus is saying to them, I'm going to prepare a place to make it possible for you so you can come as well. And it's that sense of togetherness, that celebration of us being together. And Paul knows this. And he says, my life, I have done what the Lord has called me. And I feel ready. It's better for me to go so I can spend my eternity with the Lord and with those people that I love. But you see, we don't tend to talk about much about heaven. Why is it? One reason that I can think of is perhaps we are too afraid. Not many of us talk about death. Death, it's a difficult thing, isn't it? But yet scripture says that death is appointed for all of us once. And the question comes to us that many times has been asked, what is, what is dying like? Not a very pleasant question. And as much as we can't really give details of that experience, what we can certainly can give details of is that when we are absent of this body, you are present with the Lord. And that is a promise that Christ gives us. The second that you are absent of this body, it is a promise that God gives to you and a promise that God gives to me that you are with the Lord. And for me, that is enough. That is enough, brothers and sisters. Then he comes to the second point. He says in verse 22, But if I am to live in flesh, that means a fruitful labor for me. If I am to live here, that means that is a fruitful labor for me. I think the message, the idea that we can pick up of what Paul is trying to give us today, and may the Lord help us accept, 
is that as Christian, you and I, brothers and sisters, are in the way to heaven. Okay? But meanwhile, let us make a difference. While we are here, let us make a difference. I think that's what Paul would want to say to us today with that wording over there. If I am going to stay here in life, I am not going to sit around. And I'm not going to wait for something that the Lord may do. I'm going to work. That is going to be my labor. My fruitful labor in my life. And as he ponders, brothers and sisters, as he ponders and he is wrestling, what do I choose? Do I want to go with my desire, which is really strong, or do I want to go with the need? In verse 25, he makes a decision. He makes a decision. He goes on to say on that passage towards the end, he says, I'm convinced of this. I know that I will remain and continue with you all. I know that I will put my need first. Why? Why am I going to remain? He says for two things, and these are important. He says for your progress and joy in the faith. I will remain here for your progress and the joy in the faith. Your home, read the book of uh, Philippians. It's a short book, lovely book. You will find 16 times that word joy is mentioned. But mainly it refers to having joy for yourself. Paul here is saying, I am rejoicing, so should you rejoice. But here, I think he's saying something else, isn't he? He turns it around here, brothers and sisters, and he is saying that now my job is to help you rejoice. That's the reason why he stayed behind. All of the other times he's had, I rejoice in my trials, I rejoice in my difficulties. Should you, sh you should as well. But now he says, my job will be to help you rejoice. Don't you think that is what he's saying in that passage? My job is not anymore just to teach myself to rejoice in the Lord, but to help you as well to rejoice in the Lord. And what else? To progress. For your progress in your joy, in the faith. That's why we are called to make a difference, brothers and sisters. You are on the way to heaven. Yes, we are. But meanwhile, you make a difference because what we want to do is we want to help other people experience that joy just like we have in the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, one of the solutions we tend, one of the suggestions we tend to encourage people who we find that they are in depression. You know what that is? Try not to stay alone. Try to get out. Go and mingle with other people. And for Paul, he'd want to say, go out and serve. Go out and instead of focusing in your own difficulty, go out and try to make other people joyful. Go out and try to help other people rejoice. Help them with their needs. And what you will find in the process, you will feel some of that joy in yourself as well. Paul is saying, I want my life to be fruitful labor. I'm not sitting around. Go out and minister to other people. And as we look so far, there is three key elements to our health idea, brothers and sisters. First one, we saw that supreme one. 
where Paul says that Christ is going to be magnified into my life. And that's going to help me emotionally in my health. And secondly, he's saying that there is this kind of balance that then I will find in my life where I have the desire and then I have the need. I have to choose. There is battle that go on into my heart and into my life. There is many decisions that I am facing. But with Christ, I find this balance, this neutral life that I can enjoy. And then thirdly, he says, for our emotional health as well, go out to other people. Your progress and your joy of faith are my priority, Paul is, Paul is saying. So go out, mingle with other people, serve other people, and you yourself will find joy indeed. You will know this if we allow our emotions to take control before you know it. They will creep in into that seat. And what happens? Pretty soon you come to the point where it's all self-focus. It's me, me. It's all about me and my rights. Oh, it's about my pain. It's about somebody that has hurt me. And just because of that, I am angry. It's about my loss and my suffering. And because of that, I am sad. It's about my lack of control. And because of that, I am in anxiety or I am anxious. We start focusing in ourselves and self alone, brothers and sisters. But when we magnify Christ into our life, we are putting Him into that seat where it drives everything so that He can be useful. We can be useful for Him. We can be out there sharing in ministry and doing what God wants us to do. Amen? I love as we read the passage and as we take time to actually reflect upon that, to know what is happening. Paul is opening a window. And he's saying, look into my heart, look into my struggle, and see how I am managing. See how I am coping in all of these difficult times in my life. And I think sometimes we need to take time to do that, because it's what we need. Same happened with David. Through his difficulties throughout Psalms, he allows us to look through his depression, through his uh, suffering and struggles. And that helps us get a new perspective, brothers and sisters. Um, it's not enough for us just to put a joyful face on and hide everything else and hope everything else will become better. We need to put our trust in God and allow Christ to have a driving seat and hope and pray that He will help us with all of our emotions and in our difficulties that we face in life. Towards the end of the passage, He ends up with this. He says, you have ample cause to glorify in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. You know, Look around the world today, and I think there is a very wrong perspective of life that we see today. For, what, for many people, it's as if they believe that we are in this world to entertain ourselves. We are in this world to try and make ourselves feel good until the time comes for us to depart. We are not in this world for entertainment, brothers and sisters. We are not here to allow entertainment to direct us to only do the things that we are pleased to do. As with Paul, this is what we understand, that our life is focused here. We are on a mission. Our life should be directed through mission. We should be 
mission-orientated viewers of our lives. That's what Paul is saying. I am on this mission. Either it's time for me to be taken to heaven, which is great, and I'll meet Christ, or I am to fully uh, be here, and that will be my obligation. This is necessary for you. This need that I have to continue to help you grow in your faith, to help you progress. And I think that is the essence of it all. That's the message that Christ would want us to accept of what Paul is teaching us through his life. Christians, yes we are. We trust in the Lord and we have that promise that we are on the way to heaven, brothers and sisters. But in the meantime, let's make a difference. Amen? Amen. Let's make a difference and be a blessing to those that are around us. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for your word and I thank you that you are a faithful God. Lord, I pray that like Paul, you will give us that enlightenment. You will give us that strength to make Christ the biggest in our life. Amen. To allow Christ to be magnified, to honor him with all of our, every fiber of our being. Oh God, that in turn we get that balance of our emotions, of our desires. And Lord, that our truth, the faith that we have, will be in you and you alone. And God, may we, like Paul, find that obligation in our heart, where we put the need first. May we have a heart for the people that are around us. May we have a burden for your gospel. Lord. We bless your name and we thank you for everything. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.